Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Catholicism. Today I'll be discussing multiple objections to the typological argument, and in particular, objections that say typology can't establish doctrine. In light of the recent conversation uh, between Jimmy Aiken and Gavin Ortland, I've decided to contribute my own voice to the discussion now. And I will say that though the presentation title mentions Gavin, I'm also responding to other people's objections as well that are basically saying that typology cannot establish doctrine. And so I'll try to specify in the presentation when I'm talking about Gavin's objection versus when I'm talking about someone else. But let me first begin by thanking Jimmy Aiken for 30 years of research on this particular argument, the new Eliakim argument for the papacy. Now, he would claim it's the exegetical argument for the papacy from Isaiah 22. And so um, let me frame it that way then. So to Jimmy, I just want to say that, you know, it's really great to have you in the conversation and I appreciate all the work you've done. Now, someone might say at this point, aha, there we go. That's why Jimmy Aiken didn't contradict Swan in his video in response to Gavin Ortland. It's because Swan and Jimmy are friends, and so Jimmy would never say anything to contradict another Catholic apologist. And the answer is simply, that's not true. The first is that Jimmy places truth first. And so, for example, Jimmy in the past has corrected and disagreed with me before. And even now, Jimmy thinks that it's not the best move to call my argument for the papacy the new alike typological argument for the papacy. Rather, he thinks that I should just call it the exegetical argument. Over the course of the presentation, I'll engage Jimmy on this particular point. But it's worth pointing out that Jimmy does disagree with me on some matters, and he wouldn't silence that just to maintain a friend's face. The third thing I want to say is that Jimmy's comments at the end of his video were sincere. He was saying that from what he could tell, my argument is an exegetical argument for the papacy. And so with that being said, I just want to thank Jimmy for his friendship, his scholarship, and his pursuit of the truth. The contents of today's presentation are as follows. We'll first look at the context of the conversation so far. We'll look at then Aquinas' statement in the Summa and compare it against contemporary scholarship on typology. The goal of this part is to show whether or not Aquinas' argument does actually pose a problem for the way in which I define typology. Indeed, we'll actually explore in the nature of typology section what my view of typology is, why I hold to this particular perspective. And in the process, we'll encounter the objection that typology is just a shadow. And so you can't place so much stock in the types one. It's really about the anti-type. We'll then backtrack um, once again to talk about my four defenses that I gave in the original lecture. I should explain too that even the nature of typology section is going to reuse a lot of slides from my original presentation. I've seen a lot of people online who make the argument that typology can't establish doctrine making claims that make me wonder if they even watch the video. So for example, in the nature of typology section, I'll be addressing, for example, the claim that typology is not theology. I don't know what it is, but it's not theology. In the four defenses section where I defend typology establishing doctrine, we'll look at four defenses that I originally gave and that nobody seems to be mentioning in the conversation, which I find highly surprising. The next point then, especially when, that, when someone's claiming to be responding to my particular argument, but they haven't looked at what I've said. We'll then look at the objection that typology is posterior to doctrine. That is to say that you need typology doctrine in order to establish typology, but you're trying to use typology to establish doctrine. There's something viciously circular here, apparently. The next two sections, we'll look at Gavin Ortland's objections to my argument in his two most recent videos where he discusses them. And then we'll explore the nature of my argument and I'll give my conclusions on this presentation. So first, let's remember the context of the conversation. Back in 2021, Jimmy Aiken issued a video on Pints of Aquinas where he discussed, among other things, uh, the, what kinds of exegesis can establish doctrine. And in that video, he mentions the fact that typology cannot establish doctrine because it only falls under the spiritual sense of scripture. That's important for later in the discussion. Um, about less than a year later, I issue my video, The New Eliakim Typological Argument for the Papacy, where I give this four hour lecture laying out in phase one, the textual illusion between Isaiah and Matthew, and phase two, distilling um, how typology works and the fact that we do have a Peter Eliakim typology in the text, and then concluding with how we get from the typology to the papacy. 
This four hour video ends up playing a huge part in Cameron Bertuzzi's conversion to Catholicism. <clears throat> Not long after Cameron announces his conversion on um, Pines of the Aquinas, um, Dr. Ortland issues a Protestant response on the 20th of last month. He then made another video six day, days later, Can Typology Establish Doctrine? And it's in this video that Gavin Ortland uses the clip from Jimmy Aiken's original interview on Pints with Aquinas. Jimmy and I talk four days later and we discuss my argument in some detail. And we also look at where exactly we might disagree on, for example, how I define typology versus how Jimmy understands typology. The very next day, Jimmy, after you know, I look over the script and some others, he issues his response to Gavin Ortland. The next day, Gavin Ortland issues his response to Jimmy Aiken on typology. And this is where we are in the conversation. So let's first look at Aquinas' statement in the Summa. This is the Prima Pars, question one, article 10, answer to objection one. Aquinas writes the following, quote, thus in holy writ, no confusion results. For all these senses are founded on one, the literal, from which alone can any argument be drawn and not from those intended in allegory, as Augustine says. The question before us is this, is typology identical to allegory? Second, is typology not part of the literal sense of scripture? It's important to note that Aquinas does not name specifically typology. Rather, people generally assume that during this time, typology and allegory were interchangeable. So we can now ask ourselves, in reality, is typology identical to allegory? Does typology not follow the literal sense of scripture? So let's first look at the history of interpretation to understand where Aquinas is coming from. In Mitchell Chase's great work, 40 Questions About Typology and Allegory, he writes the following, quote, the term allegorical and the way it is used in the quadriga, that is to say Augustine's fourfold distinction on the senses of scripture, is a large enough umbrella to incorporate typology. This may seem like a counterintuitive point because this book does not argue that typology equals allegory. Yet early interpreters did not make hard and fast distinctions between allegory and typology. Somebody might say at this point, aha, Swan, there goes your argument. Because if the early interpreters did not make a hard and fast distinction between allegory and typology, then they obviously must be one and the same. My answer is simply this. First, I don't think this necessarily follows. For example, just because it might be historical fact that there were no hard distinctions made between typology and allegory, that doesn't mean that as the terms have developed, that a real distinction is there and that should be noted. The second thing I should point out too is whether or not the, in the history of interpretation did a distinction between typology and allegory develop. That is to say that is the position universal and final that typology and allegory are not distinct? Well, when we look at the history of interpretation on allegory and, and, and typology, we see the following, quote, yet Bonaventure, that is a contemporary of Aquinas, still focused on the illuminative aspect of scripture, identifying types apart from allegory. So notice that even during Aquinas' time, there were people who were arguing that typology and allegory are distinct, such as a contemporary of his, St. Bonaventure. But even when we look at St. Thomas Aquinas himself, we read in Craig Carter's book, Interpreting Scripture with the Great Tradition, as the Lubach shows, Thomas's concept of the literal sense includes within itself much of the exegetical and homiletic wealth of meaning that previously had been seen as the spiritual or allegorical sense. What this quote shows us is that even Aquinas's own work, though relying upon the fourfold distinction or the quadriga, is itself a development in the history of interpretation. That is to say that even for Aquinas, things that were originally classified under the allegorical or spiritual sense, he was willing to include within the literal sense. This is to simply make the point that the idea of allegory and typology have developed throughout the history of interpretation. And so we see then that today we find ourselves with a distinction between typology and allegory in contemporary scholarship. Now, I think that this was a move in the right direction among contemporary exegetes. And as we've already shown, there's been developed in the history of interpretation. Now, for example, somebody might say, 
Well, look, um, in the early interpreters, we have no hard and fast distinction, right? So surely that has to count for something. And I suppose that that does count for something. But what also needs to count is the fact that even throughout the history of the church, these ideas have developed. There have been recent developments and research throughout history that have proven to sophisticate and eventually make typology and allegory distinct. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, was this a legitimate development? When we look at contemporary scholarship, we see the following. To quote R.T. France in his book, Jesus and the Old Testament, quote, on the other side, typology is not allegory. It is grounded in history and does not lose sight of the actual historical character of the events with which it is concerned. To give an example of allegory, think about the epistle of Barnabas, when Bar uh, the author uh, of the text makes the argument that the law of Moses doesn't actually say, for example, don't eat pork. That might be what the words actually say, but in reality, what the law of Moses is saying there is don't act like a pig. The issue with that type of interpretation is that it doesn't take into account the original historical context of how the law of Moses was understood and what the prohibition against eating pork actually meant. It meant don't eat pork. Rather, with the allegorical interpretation, things are stretched far beyond their original historical context. Now, the argument that I'm making for typology is claiming that there is a historical correspondence between the persons of Eliakim and Peter. And moreover, there's a correspondence in terms of their elevation. In Isaiah 22, 22, Eliakim is elevated into the office of chief steward, or what scholars today unproblematically, I think, call the office of prime minister in ancient Israel. That's the closest analog for today's terminology. In the New Testament, we likewise see Peter elevated into a position of great authority. And it should also be noted that as Eliakim was replacing Shebna, many scholars hold that Peter was replacing perhaps the scribes and the Pharisees. So there's a typology here between historical persons and historical events. Now, at this point, someone else might say, well, look, Swan, your interpretation is so fast and loose that it's basically allegory. Once again, that doesn't necessarily follow. For example, I could be making a typological argument. Whether it's a good or a bad one is a separate question. And so I think we should get our categories right as we go forward in the conversation. To quote Grant Osborne in The Hermeneutical Spiral, quote, unlike typology, allegory is a symbolic interpretation of details in the text or story. In Walter Kaiser and Moises Silva's book, Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics, they write, quote, typology should not be confused with symbolism, allegory, or prophecy. I saved this quote for last because I think it explains where Jimmy and I might be differing on this issue. That is to say why Jimmy would prefer to call the argument an exegetical one as, uh, as opposed to a typological one. To quote from Craig L. Blomberg's and others' introduction to biblical interpretation, quote, second, Luther followed those medievalists who rejected the allegorical method of interpretation because in his view, it amounted to empty speculation. Instead, with Aquinas, he affirmed that scripture had one simple meaning, its historical sense. This is discerned, Luther said, by applying the ordinary rules of grammar in the light of the church fathers and the medievalists. He read the Bible through Christocentric glasses, claiming that the whole Bible, including the Old Testament, taught about Christ. Thus, while rejecting allegory, Luther took up, again, the typological interpretation typical of the New Testament. It's worth noting a few things in this quote. The first is that the idea of making a sharp distinction between allegory and typology and of emphasizing the literal sense of scripture, which Luther saw as being uh, incorporating typology, is something that was developed from Aquinas and others, perhaps. But even Luther himself recognized a kind of distinction between the two. So typology and allegory are not necessarily one and the same. We see within this quote itself a development within the tradition. The other thing I should note is that, generally speaking, it seems as if earlier on, the medievalists were correcting this trend, like Aquinas, that early on, allegory and typology were not neatly distinguished, such that you could get all kinds of interpretations that weren't strictly controlled and precise. So we see in the earlier part of church history that allegory and typology are not neatly distinguished. As time passes and a greater concern comes in for the literal sense of scripture, 
typology and allegory are distinguished with typology being understood as a literal form of interpretation. Now, this is an important point to make because technically speaking, the position that I'm arguing from, that there is a real distinction between typology and allegory is from the Protestant tradition, or at least has roots within the medieval Catholic tradition, but was further developed in the, in the Protestant tradition. So some Catholics who maybe hold to a more traditional understanding of at least traditional relative to the history of the church, they would more likely view allegory and typology in the spiritual sense as one and the same altogether. Whereas in my argument, I'm using typology in light of contemporary developments within the history of the church, and specifically in terms of the Protestant tradition. And Jimmy and I even remarked that maybe this is where we differ. Jimmy, for example, said that Swan seems to use a Protestant notion of typology. He mentioned this in our one-on-one -on -one conversation. Now, it's not Protestant in the sense that I am holding to any distinctively Protestant ideas or distinctive Protestant doctrines. It's Protestant insofar as it is coming from a specific historical tradition. For example, even other Catholic New Testament scholars have told me the field of biblical scholarship is really a Protestant discipline. That doesn't mean that biblical scholarship requires, let's say, a Catholic to drop their Catholic beliefs or to become Protestant in their methodology. It's just simply noting a historical fact. And so when I say Protestant notion of typology, I don't mean literally like a Protestant notion that has Protestant distinctive doctrines in it. Rather, what I'm stating is that simply historically speaking, the interpretation that I'm using, the distinction between typology and allegory comes from the Protestant tradition. And so it's interesting to note that I, as a Catholic, I'm using um, a theory of typology that is developed from Protestant scholarship. I'm trying my best to be as accommodating as possible and to also, I think, appreciate the scholarship that has been given to us. So now let's rewind and go back to my original presentation on my channel where I describe the nature of typology. And it's important to understand in our conversation going forward what typology is. To quote from Michael Fishbane in his book, Biblical Interpretation in Ancient Israel, quote, inner biblical typologies constitute a literary historical phenomenon. So notice it's a phenomenon that's literary insofar as it exists within the text and its narrative, but it's also historical in that it's not merely claiming symbolism or such, but literally that there is a correspondence in history by God's predestination of two figures, events, practices, etc., which isolates perceived correlations between specific events persons, or places early in time with their later correspondence. They would never be precisely identical with their prototype, but inevitably stand in a hermeneutical relationship with them. Two things here. The first is that some people will say, aha, Swan, see, they will never be precisely identical with their prototype. I agree. I have never argued in my particular case for the papacy that Eliakim and Peter are going to always have one-for-one -one correspondence, to use Gavin Ortland's terminology. Rather, I've argued in different ways for elevation. I've also mentioned what properties of Eliakim are probably not going to transfer over into the New Testament to the New Covenant. The second thing is that, look, when you have types being established and they're anti-types, they stand in a hermeneutical relationship. That is to say that there is a meaning there that needs to be distilled. There's something going on in the text and the narrative that needs to be paid attention to. And that's why I want to stress, we need to interpret the typology. To quote Jonathan Rivet Robinson in his dissertation, Mark and Typology, Miracle, Scripture, and Christology, he quotes, he says, quote, Francis Young's definition is chosen here to avoid anachronistic categorical precision. For example, in commentaries on Galatians and 1 Corinthians, debates over whether Paul employs allegory, typology, or analogy potentially miss the point. These are not distinctions Paul would necessarily have made. When applied to ancient authors, these distinctions create unnecessary and potentially misleading analytical categories. Correspondences of all kinds were potentially significant and could be employed. Thus, the term typology is here intended to be heuristic, end quote. Someone at this point might say, aha, Swan, see, your distinction between typology and allegory is anachronistic. You're trying to have this analytic precision and categories that Robinson rejects. Now, we need to remember the context of not only where, why I mentioned this in my presentation, but also the context of contemporary scholarship. 
The goal of contemporary scholarship has been to go back into the earliest sources and see in them, how did they understand typology? And so actually one could say that it might be anachronistic to kind of separate typology and allegory here. And so in this part of the presentation in the original lecture, what I was trying to do was trying to show that even the contemporary um, scholarly notion of typology and the distinction between allegory is not anachronistic. It is based upon the scholars going back to the original sources and developing a more precise understanding of what is typology. And don't worry, I'll have more quotes here soon to defend the typological interpretation of scripture that contemporary scholarship has proposed. To quote once again from Robinson, in this limited sense, a Markan type is a correspondence. Notice that it's a correspondence, right? So this is still consonant with what I said before from Fishbane. Between persons or events in the gospel with person or events from scripture, which Mark has used in the composition of the gospel and which can be expected to contain hermeneutical significance. So notice that this is remarkably similar to what Fishbane said. And Fishbane, I think, does a pretty good job of expressing what the scholarly position is on typology. So on the one hand, somebody might try to use the previous Robinson quote to say, ah, Swan, your interpretation is anachronistic. But when you look at the interpretation of typology that Robinson gives in his desire to not be anachronistic, it matches the contemporary scholarly notion, showing you that the contemporary scholarly notion is an attempt to get past anachronism and go back to the original sources. To once again quote from my previous lecture, we can look at, for example, R.T. France's Jesus and the Old Testament, where he writes, quote, a type thus presents a pattern of the dealings of God with men that is followed in the anti-type when in the coming of Jesus Christ and the setting up of his kingdom, those dealings of God are repeated, though with a fullness and finality that they did not exhibit before. So notice that once again, this is a claim, at least typology is a claim, about God's dealings with mankind and how he has set up salvation history. It is intimately connected to the doctrine of providence and predestination. The other thing that I should mention is that some people will say at this point as well, oh look, R.T. France says, though with a fullness and finality that they did not exhibit before. Ergo typology is just the shadow. I'm going to address this in further detail, but when you look at what the scholars are saying, they certainly are not saying that the anti-type is all that really matters and we can ignore the type. No, they recognize that there is an important hermeneutical relationship between the two. Moreover, when I, they mention fullness and finality, what they mean is relative to the plan of salvation history. There are other things too that we can mention, but for right now, I think this is sufficient and we'll get to the objection that typology is just a shadow soon. Craig L. Blomberg in A Handbook of New Testament Exegesis writes the following, quote, the best solution is to understand the ancient Jewish and Christian use, uh, excuse me, Greek use of typology. The word typos means a pattern or model. One helpful definition is, quote, and here he's quoting R.T. France, the recognition of a correspondence between New and Old Testament events based on a conviction of the unchanging character of the principles of God's working and a consequent understanding and description of the New Testament event in terms of the Old Testament model. So notice what France is saying, and as I said before, the New Testament event is understood in terms of the Old Testament model. There's something about the Old Testament type that is relevant to our interpretation of the New Testament anti-type. To continue, in the theistic worldview of the ancient Mediterranean world, the assumption was that God revealed himself in consistent, discernible ways. For the Christian, it could not have been a coincidence that just as the children of Israel had come out of Egypt when God gave Moses the revelation on Mount Sinai, now again Jesus, the inaugurator of the new covenant, had to return to Israel from Egypt before he began his ministry. The same God must be disclosing himself in both contexts. So notice that some people have said, well, typology is not theology. I don't know what it is, but it's not theology. This quote this research from Craig L. Blomberg and others, I think positively disproves that claim. Typology is the merging of theology and history. It's a beautiful marriage of the two ideas together. We're seeing God's providence, his narrative genius in action in history. The events of old are being filled full or given additional meaning, but it is meaning consistent with and even analogous to the original meaning. 
The apologetic is less straightforward than with direct prophecy, predicted prophecy and its fulfillment, but no less powerful. Richard Onsworth, in his book, Joshua Typology in the New Testament, writes, quote, what all these correspondences do have in common, however, is at least implicitly the notion that they are all determined by the divine will. It is of the nature of God's providence that he should, as it were, stamp salvation history and the religious practices of his people with the character of his saving power, making them reflections of his heavenly glory. The correspondences are of the nature of things, revealed but not created by the way in which the Old Testament is written. I wanna emphasize here that typology shows the nature of things. And so if we're debating the nature of Peter's authority or the nature of Peter and who he is, why wouldn't we use and accept typological hermeneutics? So the definition that I offered in my original lecture was simply this, and I'm mentioning it here because it's gonna help people engage more clearly with how I understand typology. Typology is the divinely authored historical correspondence between an earlier prefigured type and later fulfilling anti-type such that God's providence is made evident to his people. So in light of this definition then, I think it's highly uncontroversial to designate the Peter Eliakim, excuse me, the Isaiah 22, Matthew 16 textual illusion as being typological in nature. Now let's go to the objection that typology is just a shadow. For example, we get more information from the anti-type from the anti-type rather than the type. Ergo, you shouldn't be placing so much stock in the type. My first response is this. This objection seems to make typology superfluous. For example, what's the point of the biblical authors engaging in typology, or at least presenting typology, if the anti-type is all that really matters? For example, whenever this objection is given, it's never given much precision where exactly, if any place, the type has within this relationship. It seems to almost make the type totally are, uh, in the background and unnecessary for our exegetical project. The second thing is that I'm confused because I think the objection itself simply misunderstands typology. The term anti-type is itself a dependent term. We need to ask the question, anti-type to what and why? For example, suppose I said, my. You'd be saying or asking, my what? And if I were to give you an answer, you'd say, um, why bring that up? And the answer is simply because, look, the analogy is supposed to show that uh, typology is a dependent term, just as my you know, word, my, would be still dependent on further um, words in order to finally get at a complete idea or thought. And so to kind of refer to an the anti-type as if it can stand alone, or you know, even if we get more information about the anti-type from the anti-type, that doesn't make necessarily the type irrelevant. And this is where I think the objection goes wrong. The second thing is that I think this objection is hasty and imprecise. For example, how do we know that we aren't also underselling what information the type reveals about the anti-type? And this is the other thing too. Even if we get more information about the anti-type from the anti-type's descriptions in the later documents, the mere quantity is not the point. Why did God and the New Testament authors see a connection between the type and anti-type? We need to know something about the type as well. In other words, we can certainly say that we get a greater quantity of facts about the anti-type from its later um, and more contemporary descriptions. Sure, that's not what we're debating. We're debating what does the type, why was there a type anti-type relation in the first place? And that's where I think the interpretation of typological um, hermeneutics begins. Now to my four defenses, in which I gave in the previous lecture four responses to popular objections to typology not being able to establish doctrine. The first thing is that this is often asserted, but it needs to be defended. So we can't just merely have foot stomping here. We need an actual argument to be given. The second is that this objection often rests on a misunderstanding of typology. Typology also captures the literal sense of scripture. To quote Dr. Chase again in his book, 40 Questions, quote, typological connections are not based in the literary creativity of the human authors. God's providential hand has truly been working within history. And so a type anti-type relationship has a transcendent origin 
and a historical manifest manifestation. To quote once again from, from excuse me, to quote again, uh, to quote from Hans V. Frey in his book, The Eclipse of Biblical Narrative, quote, far from being in conflict with the literal sense of biblical stories, figuration or typology was a natural extension of literal interpretation. It was literalism at the level of the whole biblical story and thus of the depiction of the whole of historical reality. Now, somebody might point out at this point, look, it says a study in 18th and 19th century hermeneutics. So on, this is not, uh, this is anachronistic. Well, I wanna first cite that, Kep, uh, that uh, Van Hooser in his book, Is There a Meaning to This Text? uses this particular quote to basically illustrate the point I'm making, that typology has a historical literal character to it. The other thing too, is that simply speaking, I think that Frey is correct in his assessment. And he's simply showing that within the development of history, we've seen a clearer understanding of typology. So now we can incorporate my previous arguments for the fact that more recent scholarship has tried to go back to the original understanding of typology. And so actually, far from being anachronistic, it just so happens that in the 18th and 19th century, there was a greater emphasis on trying to get back in at least typology to the original usage and understanding. The third objection that I have to this objection is that, look, the claim that typology can't establish doctrine is counterintuitive in practical application. Suppose Jesus said, I will give you the pen of the White House. Whatever you veto shall be vetoed. Whatever you sign shall be signed. Given the fact that Jesus is in this context giving a kind of command, if you will, or an order on how something is to be built, he is bestowing something to someone. Our ears should perk up and pay attention. What exactly is the Lord saying? I mean, who wouldn't think that Jesus was establishing an office or at least something here that is of significance to us in the church? So in other words, I don't think even this idea of typology not being able to establish doctrine respects the words and the communication of Christ. Rather, we need to go to Christ's words and see what he's saying. As Onsworth noted, typology reveals the nature of things. If we are debating the nature of Peter's authority, but we have already ruled out a scriptural means by which the nature of something is shown, then we have already closed ourselves off to the evidence. This is incredibly convenient if you can say that a way in which scripture reveals the nature of things is irrelevant when we are debating the nature particularly of Peter's authority in Matthew 16, 19. Rather, let scripture speak. Let's look at the text and respect how it is communicating to us. If the Lord saw a typological relationship between Peter and Eliakim, let's see what the Lord was saying there, rather than saying a priori, oh, sorry, Jesus, typology can't establish doctrine. You were saying something here, Jesus, but we don't really know what. The next objection is this. Typology is posterior to doctrine. There are two versions of this objection. The first is you need doctrine in order to establish typology. And so typology cannot establish doctrine. My first response is simply to deny that you need doctrine in order to establish typology. I think you need this. One, you need to understand the nature of typology as it has been used historically within the ancient context of the New Testament and its surrounding world. The next thing you need to have also is a kind of textual warrant in order to establish a typological claim. Then typological connections should be in principle identifiable by the competent reader. <clears throat> the approach that I'm taking is very much like a scientist who is using observational data in order to come up with models and theories and then testing to see if those models fit best with the evidence. So for example, consider this analogy and thank you to Christopher Tomaszewski for this example. Um, I'm kind of modifying it for my purposes but in the original context, he was using it against uh, Stephen Nemesh's claim that typology is posterior to doctrine. If you understand the nature of natural phenomena and have observational data, then your theory should be in principle verifiable by any competent researcher. That is how I would characterize what we are doing here in this particular context. Response number two, typology can establish doctrine if we understand scripture, you know, analogously like scientific data, interpretive theories like scientific theories, and we understand the job of the exegete like that of the scientist to best interpret the data. And so once again, it's not problematic, for example, if we were to say in the Adam Christ typology, 
you know, when we look at what properties transfer and what properties don't, if you point out in the New Testament, well, Jesus didn't doom humanity like Adam. So that doesn't transfer over. On the way that I'm viewing all this, that's great because you are using the scriptural data to show what transfers over and what doesn't. And so whatever model would say something like everything from Adam transfers over to Christ one for one, that model would be falsified. Objection two, typology only elucidates, it does not establish. The first uh, response that I would have is this. There is not a neat distinction between elucidating versus establishing. Let me use an example. Philippians 2.6 elucidates, though he was in the form of God and equal with God, speaking of the person of Christ. So it seems as if here we have something that is elucidating the nature of Christ's relationship to God, but also establishing the fact that, yes, Jesus is in fact divine. And so there is not a neat distinction between elucidating and establishing. Now, here are two responses that someone might give. No, that's establishing doctrine. But hold on. It's also a text that's revealing the nature of Christ's relationship to God. How is the Peter Eliakim typology not revealing the nature of Peter in light of Eliakim? In other words, both of these texts are doing something similar insofar as explaining, if you will, except Matthew 16, 19 uses typology to explain the relationship between Peter and Eliakim. And in this text, we see Paul using um, the language of the form of God and being equal with God to explain the relationship of Christ to God the Father. The point I'm simply making here is that I think we're seeing, once again, people arbitrarily deciding, no, that's elucidating. Oh, no, no, and that's establishing. But when you look deep down at the text themselves, they are elucidating and establishing. So, for example, I think, as I said before, you know, when someone says, well, no, that's an establishing, this text is establishing doctrine, or no, that's not an elucidating passage, try again. My question in return is, why isn't this considered an elucidating passage? It's explaining Christ's relationship to God. This seems to be arbitrarily deciding what is elucidating versus establishing. And when I upload the final version of this to PowerPoint onto academia.edu, I'll fix the typos. So once again, this is foot stomping. This is not actually an argument. We need an argument or else simply the statement is begging the question. Sure, that's how you interpret typology. That's how you view it. You haven't given me any reason to really think uh, that I should accept your particular view. Now to Gavin Ortland's videos. So in his response to Cameron Bertuzzi's conversion, um, he begins at the 34, 20, uh, 35, 24 second mark, or at least this is where I'm beginning in the video. You allow yourself to say that Peter is the new Eliakim, but in a way that Jesus isn't the new Eliakim. We'll do this with Matthew 16 and this with Revelation 3, 7. Now, I, do, I did include a comment here, so sorry to break the flow, but you know I skipped forward in Gavin's uh, kind of long video here. I think it's over 50 minutes to get to the point that I'm really focusing on. And so I want to extend the same courtesy to others. If you, uh, in my four hour long lecture, don't have the time to watch all of it, that's fine. But please look at the sections that you need in order to go forward. Or else what we're gonna find ourselves in is you know, like a professor who's having to deal with students who didn't do the reading. So let's now engage Gavin Ortland's particular objection here. So Gavin seems to be saying that we are making all kinds of arbitrary decisions by we're saying, oh, no, no, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a Jesus Eliakim typology, but Jesus is uh, like Eliakim in a way that Peter isn't. And the general point here is that Gavin seems to be saying there are no good principled reasons for distilling how we interpret one over the other. It's completely arbitrary. Well, let's see what other New Testament scholars and exegetes have to say. Surely there is a way to interpret the text in a plausible fashion. D.A. Carson in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, Revised Edition, even the original, writes, quote, Here, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus builds his church. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, Paul is an expert builder. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, Jesus is the church's foundation. In Ephesians 2, 19-20, the apostles and prophets are the foundation, and Jesus is the cornerstone. Here, Peter has the keys. In Revelation 1.18-3.7, Jesus has the keys. In John 9, 5, Jesus is the light of the world. In Matthew 5, 14, his disciples are. None of these pairs threatens Jesus's uniqueness. 
They simply show how metaphors must be interpreted primarily with reference to their immediate context. So notice here that D.A. Carson has no problem approaching the text and to see in what way, for example, uh, Peter is able to have the keys and Jesus is to have the keys. I'm not saying that D.A. Carson is identifying a typology here. That's not what I'm saying. But the point is that D.A. Carson doesn't seem to have the same level of skepticism that Gavin Ortland does. Rather, Carson thinks there are ways in which we can interpret these texts plausibly. And the way we do that is by looking at their immediate context. And so I'm going to claim it now that I think Gavin Ortland has skepticism run amok. I'll say it again, skepticism run amok in Gavin's position on how we interpret the text. Yes, interpretation is a difficult task. It requires a lot of sophistication and careful understanding of the source, but it can be done. And that's why I think Gavin, in a way, is being quite dismissive of all the work that me, that I, and others have done on this particular matter. So how would I approach the question at hand? Well, it would be like this. In what way is Jesus the new Eliakim, and in what way is Peter the new Eliakim? We need to look at the context of Revelation and the context of Matthew. Then we can ask two questions. First, this is a question for anybody. Can the former question be answered in such a way that it is plausible on its own terms? That is to say that the principles that we use for distilling how Jesus is like Eliakim versus how Peter is like Eliakim, are they in themselves plausible such that you don't have to controversially presuppose any distinctive Catholic doctrines or beliefs? For example, could I interpret or propose a way to distill the particular matter at hand that would also be acceptable to a Protestant exegete? The second thing is a question for me. So if I'm able to do the task of one, we need to then look afterwards and see, could the way in which I distilled how Jesus is like Eliakim and how Peter is like Eliakim, could that still preserve a papal notion of the Peter Eliakim typology? Or is it the case that the principles that we develop for figuring this thing out end up ultimately rendering a Peter Eliakim typology more limited, constrained by Jesus being the fuller type? That's an argument that I've heard people use. Well, let's look at the immediate context and figure this out together. Now, in this video, I'm not going to totally discuss this particular objection, but I want to heavily emphasize that we have skepticism run amok. There are ways to answer the questions that Gavin, uh, that Gavin is raising. To quote from the 34, uh, excuse me, 33, 14 second mark, second of all, the uses of typology are arbitrary. It's in the eye of the beholder. So I wanna say that my team and I have been making great progress on this issue. And when I say see next slide, the next slide is just basically gonna show you that even in the four hour lecture, I mentioned that the argument is still underdeveloped, uh, is still, yeah, it's still under development and being further perfected as time goes on. And so these kinds of engagements, I hope will make the argument better. Moreover, Cameron Bertuzzi, Daniel Vecchio, Tyler McNabb, and other friends in the team that I've been assembling have been incredibly helpful in leading us forward to come up with better and stronger typological interpretations. But I do wanna say that even at this point of my arguments development, at least from what I have publicly, it's not totally arbitrary. In the original lecture around the three hour 38, 53 second mark in slide 100, I explain a way in which we can distill what from Eliakim transfers over to Peter. And moreover, I cite scholars like John T. Willis, who likewise believe that yes, Jesus is establishing Peter as a kind of major domo, prime minister, or chief steward. So once again, this is a bit of an overstatement on the part of Gavin. To say that it's in the eye of the beholder might win you some points, but it's not really accurate to what's going on. At the 33-20 minute mark, it says some, officer, some offices transfer from the Davidic monarchy. Some are carried over to the New Covenant era, but not others. Why? Who says? Well, in my nearly comprehensive response to Gavin Ortland on my YouTube channel, the edited version of my Reason and Theology presentation, at the 43 minute 25 second mark, I actually specifically address this objection. And I talk about how, for example, it really is Jesus who decides what offices transfer over. Moreover, if we in fact have evidence that, for example, the financial secretary uh, in the Old Testament transfers over into the New Testament, we have some type of textual warrant, then I would be totally willing to accept that as a kind of argument. 
See, I think the, the type of typology that people are rejecting and suspicious of would be something like this. In the Old Testament, you had financial officers. In the New Testament, you have, for example, Philip or even Judas who are managing the finances of the disciples. Ergo, Philip and Judas are the new financial ministers of the Davidic kingdom. The issue with this interpretation is that we don't have any textual warrant for connecting anything from the uh, New Testament um, figures back to the Old Testament figures. What we have are conceptual functional similarities, but we have no textual features like a direct textual illusion or substitution of terms or other exegetical markers to warrant creating a scriptural bridge. Whereas we definitely have an Isaiah 22, Matthew 16 parallel. I think that is the kind of typology that people are, have been, and should be rejecting. The other thing I want to mention too is Gavin has not mentioned any of my responses in his recent videos. Gavin, I know for a fact, has watched my lecture where I respond to him and give it the, the nearly comprehensive response. So Gavin ought to know better that I have given responses to these issues, but he leaves the question why, who says open-ended as if nobody has engaged the issue. It gives the impression to the audience that I haven't engaged this point. Because once again, all of these statements are being made in the context of my typological argument being critiqued. And so when you say why, who says, well, it seems to imply that Swan has remained silent or hasn't said anything about this particular issue. Moreover, when you are doing a philosophical debate or writing a philosophical paper, the first thing that you try to do is represent your opponent well, show their responses and address them. But if you simply don't mention their responses, then you're kind of letting yourself get away with a point that needs to be debated. Look, I have tried my best to represent Gavin well. I try to quote him. I even had an email correspondence with him where he corrected my lecture, a nearly comprehensive response, and I incorporated his corrections into the final cut of the presentation, even when I was wrong, I was mistaken, I publicly apologized, and I admitted it. So I wish that Gavin would extend me the same courtesy here. Around the 33 minute, 38 second mark, um, Gavin says once again, some aspects of this office carry over, but not others. Why? Well, in the original lecture, or uh, that is to say the new Eliakim typology for our lecture, around the three hour, 31 minute, 43 second mark, if you're looking at the presentation, it's on slides 99 to 100, I actually specifically talk about why certain features of the office do not carry over in light of the nature of the new covenant. Moreover, if anybody were debating with, let's say, our, our, our Jewish brothers and sisters, well, if you're saying that Jesus is the new Davidic king, that he is the son of David, then where's this taxation policy? Where's the te physical temple? Where is the peace and harmony that the Messiah is supposed to bring? Where is he located on this earth where he is ruling over the earth? Then we can say, well, no, here's what transfers over and here's what doesn't. So notice everybody, even you know Christians, we are all engaging in the issue of what transfers over and what doesn't. We all are doing some type of interpretation in this area. So to say that it's completely arbitrary then seems to also make Christianity itself seem to be based on totally arbitrary assertions. What is the continuity between the old and the new? And can we answer this question? I think to simply say, no, we can't, or it's too difficult, is simply shutting down the conversation. It's not bringing us forward. Now, I do want to mention on an, as an aside that I'm skeptical of Eliakim's office being biologically hereditary now. I mean, for example, think about the predecessor of Eliakim, Shebna. Shebna, from what we can tell, was a foreigner in the land of Judah. He was not originally from there. If that's the case, then the likelihood of a biological relationship between Shebna and Eliakim is incredibly low, if not incredibly distant. But still, the office being biologically hereditary seems suspect to me. And I've seen other commentators begin to question, why did we say that this office is biologically hereditary? So I'd like to know, can anyone help me on this point to see, was the office intrinsically biologically hereditary? If so, then that's fine. I can use my previous response in the previous lecture, but still, I would like to know more information on this point. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, I was going to bring up the fact that I said from the very beginning, or at least in slide 96 of the previous lecture, that I, this is an argument still in development. As I said, 
more data needs to be added into the evidential calculus in order to get the specifics. And that's what my team and I are currently working on. But the Eliakim type sets up slash anticipates much of what's in the papacy hypothesis. That's an important point to make. There are a lot of things about Eliakim that seem to fit really well with the papacy. Now, I know that Gavin Ortland objects to that particular claim, and I've addressed that even in the previous slide in the previous lecture, and I think I'll mention it again later in the presentation as well. So Gavin says around the 32, 30 mark, because it's such a flexible hermeneutical category typology, to use it responsibly, okay, so look, there's potentially a responsible use of it. You have to look at the text and what the author is doing with it. And this is why historically typology has not been used to establish dogma, but rather to explicate and clarify dogma. So I agree with Gavin Ortland that we need to look at the text and see what the author is doing with it. As Gavin will later explain, however, what he means is we need to look strictly at the words of Matthew 16 alone. Now, in my own position, what I am saying is, look, when you look at the words of Matthew 16, he is doing the typology. And so by interpreting the typology, you are interpreting the words of Matthew 16. This is an important distinction between Gavin and I, and I'll also eventually raise more objections to this particular way in which Gavin is interpreting uh, the text. But for right now, if you go to the original lecture, the one hour 49, 33 second mark, slide 53 of my presentation, you'll see how I identify typology. And the first standard that I have is textual appraisal. That is to say, we need some type of textual warrant to connect one figure to another. We need perhaps common words, common um, echoes, if you will, to use Richard Hayes's terminology. We need something from one text to another that really does connect them. Regarding the um, historical point about why historically typology has not been used, I can unproblematically concede the historical point, especially if the church was still figuring out the distinction between typology and allegory. I can accept that unproblematically, and so that's fine. Gavin then says, and this is why I would say careful Roman Catholics today don't use this argument for the papacy and historically <clears throat> has not been used. So the first thing I want to say is that I'm probably the only Catholic apologist who designates this argument as a typological argument. Now, the reason why I call it typological is because I am more ingrained in, in Protestant New Testament scholarship. That was my upbringing, and also because I converted two years ago, that's my more recent background. Although Catholics who have been in the game longer, who are cradle Catholics, who have been converts longer than I have, they might be viewing typology in the sense that typology is not distinct from allegory, the, if you will, older but not oldest interpretation of the relationship between the two. However, what I've noticed is that many other Catholic apologists <clears throat> use an argument of this sort, of the one that I'm using, without calling it typological. So um, I think in the um, next few points, I actually mention in particular uh, the commonalities between me and Jimmy's position. To go on, you can find scholars and historical figures who still reference or who will reference intertextuality between Matthew 16 and Isaiah 22. We all agree on that. You don't find this argument for the papacy that I'm aware of. I don't know how much this argument exists outside of YouTube. There's a few things I want to say here. The first is that Daniel Vecchio has done extensive research on the, histor on the, on the hist history of the Isaiah 22, Matthew 16 textual illusion. So it's worth checking that out. I'm not going to say, oh, and what, what Vecchio points out is that even before the Reformation, there were fathers post-schism who were making a kind of typological argument between Peter and Eliakim. They might not use the words typology explicitly, but they do make many references to how Peter is like Eliakim. And this is essentially to me, establishing a typological relationship. I should also mention this. I really don't think that designating this argument as typology is controversial. For example, I just think it's the accurate term for what's going on here. Consider if you walked into a store, the door was busted open, the glass is broken, all the jewelry has been taken out of the displays, the cash register is empty. Suppose you looked at this scene and said, this is a crime. By using that word, you are encapsulating all the data and you would be simply making an almost kind of obvious point. I think the situation between the scriptural data that we have between Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16 is the same. 
just calling it typological just seems to me to be the proper designation. And so I don't think it's controversial if you understand how typology is used by contemporary scholars. An unrelated update on this research though is this. Theodoret of Cyrus in the fifth century is the earliest one to note the Isaiah 22, Matthew 16 allusion. Now someone has disputed and said, no, it's Matthew 18, 18, but I have it on the authority of Father Christian Caps, who translated Theodoret of Cyrus's commentary on Isaiah that no, Matthew 16 is what is being used. We had originally said that Ephraim the Syrian was the earliest source, but I think in light of recent developments, we basically agree that this is not um, an, an Isaiah 22, Matthew 16 illusion. For example, Ephraim mentions the old Simon and how he had the keys over uh, the temple and the finances and so on and so forth, or at least over, I should just say over the temple um, uh, and not add beyond that. What I have found, and through the help of, I think it's Nicholas Champagne, is that um, the reference of Ephraim there is to second Maccabees of a high priest named Simon who had keys of the temple and had the power to basically govern all of the affairs going on. And so Ephraim is using second Maccabees to distill the nature of Peter. Now in the original lecture around the two hour, three minute, 38 second mark, slides th uh, 58 to 59, I also identify two scholars who identify Eliakim as the type of Peter. I believe it is Benedict Green and Benedict Viviano two New Testament scholars writing on the Gospel of Matthew who make the point that Eliakim is the Old Testament type of Peter. So I do want to say that this argument does exist beyond just YouTube. To go to the 3411 minute mark, Gavin says, thirdly, let's suppose you gave the typology maximum flexibility. You put the typology into the hands of the interpreter. You say, look, there's some kind of usage of Isaiah 22 here in Matthew 16. So do anything you want with that. Whatever you see in this office, the type, apply it, bend it, change it, fly as high as you want in the sky with it, whatever you want to do with it, and then apply it to the anti-type. Although Gavin isn't saying explicitly that this is my methodology, I do think it is implied or inevitably tacked on to me. Anybody who is watching this lecture is going to know, or at least we will know that he's responding to me. But he's, they're also going to make the connection, oh, well, Swan seems to be making maximum flexibility with the typology. And so Swan is doing all these crazy flips and turns and bending and changing it and flying as high as he wants with it. And I would just like to say, I wish that Gavin would explain my side of things and steel man first, rather than jumping into these characterizations. I wish he would say my side of things as I am sharing his side of the issue. I want to stress this again. I wish he would share my side of things, steel man my position, as I am trying my best to steel man his side of the issue and represent him well. Gavin goes on to say, that would still nonetheless amount to an argument against the papacy, because Eliakim's office is nothing like the papacy. It's not priestly, it's not teaching, it's not supreme, and it's not infallible. Not only is there no infallible dogma that any holder of this office gives throughout the Old Testament, the office of Eliakim looks nothing like the papacy. Now, notice what's going on here. Um, Gavin actually seems to have a typological principle here. He's expressing a principle that you need to have the office holder uh, give an infallible dogma so that we can get to something like the papacy. So he has a kind of expectation on if this transfer really does work, here's what the transfer needs to do. So as I mentioned later in the lecture, uh, th that is a, this lecture, I think that's where the fundamental debate is. What are the principles for interpreting typology responsibly, as Gavin puts it, and well? The other thing to note once again is that I actually do explicitly respond to basically everything that Gavin has said here in my original lecture, the two hour 37, 34 minute mark, where I mentioned that Eliakim's office is priestly, that it is supreme, that it has a teaching capacity based on what we can see from the text. And it is, I think, and now it could be argued to be infallible. And I mentioned this in slides 79 to 96. Let me go into each of these briefly. When it comes to the priestly aspect, Gavin has continually insisted that Eliakim had no relationship to the temple. The problem is that simply, if not all of the contemporary scholarship on this issue contradicts Gavin Ortland on this point, it's, it's, it's really hard to hear Gavin say this and know what to do with it. 
it would be like someone saying, I don't know, Caesar didn't cross the Rubicon or something like, and you have all the contemporary scholarship backing up, note Caesar backed the Rubicon. Eliakim's office being priestly was mentioned, for example, in my original lecture in, I forget the first name of this uh, scholar, but Prakasama's dissertation on Eliakim having a temple connection. And actually Prakasama goes so far as to say, it, Eliakim had not only power over the temple, but power also over the civil government. So he was a prime minister, if you will, and a priest at the same time. And then even Jewish reception of Isaiah 22, like in the, in the Targums, for example, has Eliakim portrayed as a high priest of sorts. So once again, the claim that Eliakim is not priestly is simply not keeping up with the scholarship on this issue. And moreover, P uh, Gavin, once again, does not mention any of my research or scholarship on this issue. He does not mention anything here. He simply asserts it, moves on as if I have not said anything. When it comes to the supremacy of Eliakim's office, the thing to remember about papal supremacy is that it is a claim about the universal and immediate jurisdiction of the Pope. So universal in the sense that it, the church itself on the earth is within the domain of the ruling authority of the Pope. So it's not as if, for example, the Pope is only the Bishop of Rome and only remains in the, uh, in the Roman diocese. The other thing is that the authority is immediate in that the Pope has real authority that isn't necessarily bound all the time through the bishops. So for example, Vatican I and the Relatio Bishop Gasser, which is the official interpretation of Vatican I, explains that by immediate authority, you can think of it like this. When the Pope declares something ex cathedra, it is not infallible because he has the manifest consent of all the bishops. It's not, for example, you know, over 50% of the bishops said you're infallible, uh, Mr. Pope, so your decree is infallible. That's our decree. No, no, no. The Pope, when he declares something ex cathedra, is infallible through the, inner, through the working of the Holy Spirit. But if the Pope were to teach something ex cathedra without consulting his brother bishops, then he would be in a state of mortal sin. It would be a serious offense to the collegiality of the church. And so once again, there are nuances in the concept of supremacy. Eliakim had universal jurisdiction insofar as what remained of Israel, well, technically Israel was occupied during this time, we're in Judah now, what remained of the Israelite kingdom was under his jurisdiction. Even God mentions, for example, that he will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to Judah. So you have universal jurisdiction. Do you have immediate jurisdiction? Did Eliakim have to go through anyone to make his rulings valid? No. In Isaiah 22, 22, God says, whatever you open, none shall shut. Whatever you shut, none shall open. Various scholars, like, for example, Donald Guthrie and others in the New Bible Commentary, mention the fact that this is an authority that basically anyone under Eliakim cannot overrule his teaching. He can decree it. He can rule it. He can make his decision happen. He does not have to go through anybody else. Um, the only person above him would be the king. I do mention in the original lecture the fact that Eliakim has teaching authority. I argue this from, um, uh, from Jotham in particular, who seems to be a judge of sorts. And I do explain why I think Jotham at least held this office in a particular way. When it comes to infallibility, once again, the root idea of infallibility is that you have a permanent ruling being given. If Eliakim can make rulings that no one can overrule, below the king, then that gives us an idea that Eliakim can make definitive rulings. So if that is the case, then if we could argue somehow that Peter can also make definitive rulings, and then we include the gift of infallibility, where God will ensure that the church will not be permanently bound to error, then I think we have a plausible case for infallibility. The other thing I'll say too, is that when you look at Matthew 16, 19, you not only have just whatever you bind on earth will be bound, it's whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. There is clearly heavenly backing. Now, someone might say, oh, Swan, that's just your interpretation. Even in my own lecture, I believe in the original lecture, I do cite scholars who also do recognize that something is going on here where Peter has divine backing in his rulings. So once again, these are many points that I've already addressed before extensively. I really would like to not to have to constantly mention, okay, I already said this, I already said this, here I am saying it again. I would like for the conversation to progress and really flourish.
Once again, uh, Gavin says, it's just a minor office. We can hardly name anything that anyone who held this office ever did. And after a lie, Kim, it just completely fades away. So see my previous response where I discussed that this is clearly not a minor office. Moreover, anyone who is in Israelite archaeology will tell you that the office of chief steward is not a minor office. It is probably the highest office in the land of Israel under the office of the king. So the claim here is painfully wrong. And I can't, I, I don't like stressing how off base this, this uh, argument is, but it has to be stressed out of brotherly love that to say it's just a minor office is completely wrong. And notice in this part too, he doesn't cite any of my research. He doesn't cite any scholars, any Israelite archaeologists to support this claim that it's just a minor office. Gavin is simply stating things that, and we, where, but where's the evidence? He's just simply asserting them. And this is really disconcerting from my perspective. Now, when he says we can hardly name anything that anyone who held this office ever did, I think that's just a matter of, um, I guess, among lay people, there's not maybe a lot of familiarity with this particular office. So I don't see really what the point of this is trying to make. If you're talking about within the biblical narrative, that, for example, we don't see the prime minister popping up left and right or the chief steward. By the way, people have said that calling it a prime minister is anachronistic. I think what um, contemporary scholars are doing is noting the closest analog for our understanding. Yeah, it is chief steward. But even then, we need to understand that the scholars are aware of how powerful and important this office is. Even when you look at other ancient Near Eastern civilizations who had a similar office in their own kingdoms. So when, but the, the point I'm making here is that uh, Gavin seems to be engaging not in sola scriptura, but in solo scriptura. So my friend Daniel Vecchio has compiled extensive archeological evidence that there were successors to Eliakim. In fact, we have the bulla or the seal of one of the successors of Eliakim showing that he did have the office of chief steward after Eliakim's time. We can in fact name these individuals and identify when they ruled. So the claim that Eliakim's office just completely faded away after him is once again false. Now I will say that I, I even said that I thought the office faded away after Eliakim. Maybe, the, you know, maybe something happened, but Daniel Vecchio has corrected me and I'm thankful for it that no, the archaeological evidence outside of the Bible shows that there were successors to Eliakim. So are we going to engage in solo scriptura? If so, that is an incredibly problematic self-defeating method. And I've heard Protestants time after time again say, I believe in sola scriptura, not solo scriptura. Well, if that's the case, then don't engage in solo scriptura here. There is evidence of Eliakim having successors. Here are a cluster of comments then from Gavin's video response to Jimmy Aiken on typology. For example, it came up several times in my debate with Swan that his entire argument for papal succession is from typology. The way of thinking is Eliakim's office is successive. Peter's the antitype of Eliakim. Therefore, it's either entailed or implied to some degree that Peter's office is successive. I think this is a fair characterization from Gavin. Next, he says, it's not an argument from the text of Matthew 16. This is where I disagree with Gavin. When I'm talking about the text of Matthew 16, I'm saying the typology is built into it. For example, suppose I said break a leg. Strictly speaking from the phrase break a leg, you might be saying, or you might be thinking I'm saying break your leg. No, if you understand the text and the words and then the meaning underneath the words, you see that I'm basically saying good luck, uh, you know, and do well. So when you say just the text of Matthew 16, if you mean just the rigid understanding of just what the words precisely strictly there are saying, then that might actually be obfuscating your understanding of the meaning of the text itself. What I'm saying is that Matthew 16 is a typological passage, Matthew 16, 19. And so part of understanding the text of Matthew is understanding the typology. Or else what you're saying is, when I say break a leg, I'm literally saying, go break your leg. It's arguing that the bearer of this title 
it's is always linked with the capital city. There were similar appeals to the Davidic kingdom being carried over. He's trying to get properties like succession, supremacy, infallibility, and even the location of Rome from the typology itself, not from something that Jesus says in Matthew 16. So notice that Gavin once again is saying the typology and Matthew 16 are two separate things. That is not how I'm viewing the issue. And that's, I don't even think that's an accurate way of characterizing what's going on here. If Matthew 16 is using typology, then part of interpreting the words of Matthew 16 is to interpret the typology. So I want to look at then maybe two dialectical models in the debate that will help us going forward figure out where one side is coming from. So I think model one describes, generally speaking, Gavin Ortland's and other Protestant scholars' opinion on this matter. Look, Peter is somehow like Eliakim. The typology or the textual illusion gives us this much. Let's see how the rest of the New Testament explains how Peter is like Eliakim. Notice that all the typology is doing is connecting Peter and Eliakim. It doesn't in itself have any hermeneutical significance or weight in helping us see how Peter is like Eliakim. Typology, if you will, is just used to get our first foot in the door, but the rest of the New, uh, New Testament needs to get us all the other steps. In other words, typology doesn't seem to be doing much in this interpretation. It seems to be re-inviting the um, just a shadow model. Now, I do want to be charitable here. Because I think Protestant scholars and, uh, and apologists are going to say, well, sure, that's how you view it. But what we're also trying to do is interpret the typology. And if you say that, that's great. So let's go to model two. Model two is this. Look, Peter is somehow like Eliakim. Let's see what the typology can teach us about Peter and incorporate this into an overall New Testament portrait. At this point, many people are going to say, well, that's exactly what I'm saying, Swan. Why are you saying all the Protestants are over there? I will say this. I accept that maybe Model 2 is the better explanation of the Protestant position. What I'm saying is Model 1 generally represents what I've seen in pop presentations. Generally speaking, when you say that the type is just a shadow, it's going to sound like Model 1, and you need to stop saying the type is just a shadow, or else it looks like Model 1. What model two is saying is this, typology is itself a key data point. We need to figure out how to interpret typology. Now, if we just begin looking at other New Testament texts immediately, but we haven't established how the typology actually works, then this can, I think can prove extremely problematic. For example, to use, uh, to use um, an illustration in science, suppose that we are debating you know, evolutionary theory and we mentioned that there are gaps all over the place in the fossil record. And then somebody says, oh, but we do have this transitional fo uh, fossil of Tiktaalik rose 375 million years ago. Now, if you're a younger creationist, you know, just accept this as an illustration. You don't have to buy into the whole thing. But anyway, if I say I have this particular piece of evidence that's really significant and shows us a transitional form, and it actually makes sense of a gap within the fossil record, then that would be a relevant data point. If somebody says, oh, no, 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 but we have all these other gaps over here, then that seems to not be appreciating what this particular data point is saying. In the same way, I think we need to be focusing now in the discussion principles for interpreting typology so that what we're doing is we're giving typology its due. We can incorporate other New Testament passages to help us make sense of the typology, and we're, but we're doing so in a way that's methodologically responsible. The concern that I have is that some people are just going to jump straight to other parts of the New Testament and assume that the other things in the New Testament limit what's going on in uh, Matthew 16 and Isaiah 22. That in itself is an assumption about the nature of typological interpretation. And that's an assumption that is open to being questioned. Is that how we should view the rest of the New Testament as limiting the typology? Or is there a better way to go about doing this? That's where we need to have the discussion. To use another scriptural example, suppose that we were to look at 1 Corinthians 11.3, where it mentions that the man is the head of the woman, that men have a headship within the relationship. But then somebody says, oh, but when you look at, for example, uh, you know, the Gospels, the women are the first witnesses. Uh, they are the first evangelists, if you will. The men are the one who chicken out. They, look, the men weren't exercising headship there. Oh, and um, uh, Adam and Eve and, and how uh, Deborah was this very powerful prophet, so on and so forth. Somebody might say, oh, well, see, you look, look, the, your interpretation of 1 Corinthians 11.3 needs to be limited by these other things. 
But notice what's going on here. God in 1 Corinthians 11.3, through the apostle Paul, is giving a normative structure for how he created the relationship between men and women. These other instances then cannot be used as limits to what God is saying here. Rather, you can accommodate the other things that look like limits into the overall picture. So, for example, when we see that the men are not the ones who are confident in the resurrection of Jesus, and it is the women who are the first evangelists, we can say the men weren't really doing a good job of exercising their headship over the church, their priesthood and pastoral ministry. The women, however, have done a valiant and good thing. Or even in a marriage where, for example, a man might allow his wife to have a lot more authority on financial decisions, on what to do with his time and with his children. Out of love, he submits himself to his wife. Somebody might say, oh, but you're supposed to be the head of the family. Yes, but me being loving to my wife and giving my own authority and sharing my authority with her is not incompatible with me being the head of the family. In fact, I still retain the authority to say at a certain point, all right, honey, this is the decision we're making. I'm putting my foot down. He has that authority. So the point I'm basically making here is that if we have a situation in which Jesus is establishing by divine his divine authority, a normative structure for the church, then the other passages that are used to limit Jesus's institution of this authority needs to be accommodated and not used to limit it. What am I saying here? I'm not saying this is how you should presuppose going into the conversation, the relationship between Peter and the apostles. My point is simply, if this is how the relationship actually is, then that shapes a lot of things. If the institution of Peter's authority in Matthew 16, 19 is like Jesus establishing the, God establishing the headship of men in 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3, then we need to take that into consideration or else we're doing the whole thing wrong. In 331, Gavin says, quote, they're both not just using Matthew 16's usage of Isaiah 22, that is, get me in Cameron, the way that Jimmy is doing it. They're doing it from this broad type anti-type relationship. It would be more like Jimmy's exegetical argument for the papacy if Cameron dropped the typological part of the argument. <clears throat> Once again, I think there are two problems here, uh, three actually. The first is that we are using Matthew 16's usage of Isaiah 22. I don't think this is a fair characterization at all. We're saying that that usage is a textual, a, a textual illusion and typological one. The other thing to point out then is that Gavin is once again wedging a distinction between typology and Matthew 16, which I think totally misses the point. The other point that I should mention is that Jimmy Aiken also infers the properties of the papal office from Eliakim. Cameron Bertuzzi, I believe, has mentioned that Jimmy Aiken sent him a large document on the case for the papacy when Cameron was still discerning being Catholic. Jimmy, likewise, in our one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, over, over uh, online, did say that, yes, he does get these properties of Eliakim's, uh, excuse me, of Peter's office. And he mentioned that even the relationship between Eliakim and Peter is one of elevation. The language of elevation is typically associated with typological interpretation. So I hope that that's a fair characterization of Jimmy Aiken. He can correct me, but I think he does do more than just say, oh, look, here's a textual illusion. I think he really does go further and tries to get certain properties of Peter's office from looking at things that Eliakim had or possessed. At least, for example, if you use the standard of elevation, that still counts as part of a typological interpretation. At the four minute 11 mark, uh, G Gavin says, so there is a real misunderstanding here that I just think we need to get clarity about. There are two arguments at play. I personally don't think that there are two arguments at play. What's going on here is that Jimmy and I are having different judgments on whether it's prudent to use the word, the word typology. I think it is based on contemporary scholarship, although Jimmy, with his wisdom, understands that in terms of the history of interpretation, um, typology and allegory have been muddled together. Although that's not the case anymore, I think, that typology and allegory are muddled together. I, as I presented earlier, I don't think that's the case, and I don't think that's how we should view things. So in reality, then, I don't think there are two arguments at play. And as, we, uh, as I mentioned, and as uh, Jimmy uh, Gavin mentioned, 
and the 3145 uh, mark in the Jimmy's original video, he does say that from what he can tell, my argument appears to be a valid exegetical argument. And so Jimmy seems to be in agreement with me to some extent. So when Gavin goes on in his video, he does mention that he thinks Jimmy still is confused on the distinction between the two arguments, right? But I think that Jimmy's position looks confusing to Gavin because Jimmy and I are basically making the same argument. The clip of Jimmy that Gavin subsequently plays is remarkably similar to my own responses and arguments. When Jimmy says, for example, what transfers over, what offices go and what offices don't, it's Jesus who decides. I almost verbatim, I think verbatim, said those words in my nearly comprehensive response to Gavin Ortland. And so I am confused really with what Gavin is saying here at this particular moment. At 6.59, Jimmy says, it's Jesus who decides what carries over. And then Gavin adds, not according to Swan and Cameron. This is simply not accurate. I am using the exe exegetical tools to try and interpret the precious, precious words of Jesus Christ, just as anyone uses interpretive tools to interpret the incarnate Lord. So, I don't know, Gavin saying this really disappoints me. At the eight uh, minute, 11 second mark, Gavin says, but the better analogy would be when someone does argue that the contingency argument proves the Trinity. And if this is a characterization of my argument, then I'm also confused again, because my argument has three phases. It's like the Kalam cosmological argument, for example, where Craig first begins by establishing the first cause of the universe. But from there, he doesn't infer anything further in the first phase of the argument. But in the second phase, Craig then begins to derive the nature of the causes properties, right? So timelessness, spacelessness, immateriality, personality, and free will. Craig derives these in the second phase of the argument. My argument is remarkably similar in that the first phase is the textual illusion between Isaiah and Matthew. I'm showing that we can legitimately at least see a textual connection here. The second part of the video is to argue, the second phase is to argue that this relationship is typological. The third phase of the argument then concerns um, how to best interpret the typological relationship that is at play given the second phase of the argument. So I don't think it's a fair characterization to say that the, um, that the better analogy would be someone arguing from the contingency argument to the Trinity. The next, uh, the next part that Gavin says is this, this typological argument is not represented by all Catholic apologists or even say by most. Go back to my original response where I do mention that many Catholics over the years, I think have basically been making the new Eliakim typological argument. They've just been careful about calling it typology. Although I think that now we don't have to be so worried about it. I think it's unproblematic to call it a typological argument. And even so, when you listen to a Catholic apologist or someone in, even in the history of the church making the connection between Isaiah 22 and Matthew, pay attention to when they start saying that, oh, just as Eliakim was this, so Peter is this. At that point, you are doing a, typo a typological argument, whether or not you recognize it or say it explicitly. So you see, for example, as I mentioned in um, Oscar Kuhlmann's work on Peter, disciple, apostle, martyr, that he likewise draws these inferences about Peter at least being like Eliakim in some way. Similarly, um, F.F. Bruce, as Jimmy Aiken mentioned, and others. So I think this typological argument has there, been there for a long time. It just hasn't been explicitly called typology, but I think we're long overdue recognizing and calling a spade a spade. In 1039, um, Gab, uh, Gavin's responding to a comment from Jimmy again. Swan is mounting an exegetical argument from Matthew 16. Gavin says that is not true. It is not limited to Matthew 16. Swan is attempting, and Gavin, uh, Cameron as well, to derive these properties, these characteristics of the papacy from the typology. Once again, Gavin thinks there's a sharp distinction between the typology and the words of Matthew 16. The other thing I want to mention is that Gavin's standard is way too strict if we're taking him at his words here. For example, scholars all the time use more than just the words of Matthew 16 to understand Matthew 16. For example, what do the keys mean? Some scholars will jump then after they think they've exhausted the possible help that this passage alone can give us. 
to Acts chapter 15, when Peter opens up the church to the Gentiles. When it comes to, for example, what is the meaning of binding and loosing? We see, once again, we have to look at sources like Josephus or even Matthew 18, 18 to help us discern what's going on here. I should also say that someone might object to my characterization of Acts 15 as Peter opening up the church to the Gentiles. Very briefly, in the first 10 chapters of Acts, you see Peter taking clear command of the early church. You see him having a pro-Gentile policy. You see in Acts chapter 10, he's given the dream from God that unclean foods are declared clean. So Peter clearly here has a kind of halakhic authority to interpret divine revelation and to make rulings. In Acts 15, after there had been much debate, Peter stands up and says, brothers, you know from the early days that the Lord said it would be by my mouth that the Gentiles would enter the church. So Peter gives his ruling, Paul and Barnabas speak, but their speeches aren't recorded. And then finally, James, the Bishop of Jerusalem stands up, he gives his ruling and it is modeled after Peter's ruling. So in the process then, I would say that this is essentially how the papacy normally would and should work throughout the history of the church. Very rarely would the Pope ever want to just jump in and say, I'm taking control of your diocese. You're not a real bishop. I'm the real bishop. That's not how that works. But anyway, that's getting a bit bogged down in the details. Somebody might once again mention, well, James is the one who gives the final ruling. Um, we can. That's something that I've discussed elsewhere, even in my article on Catholic Answers. The other thing is that like typology is part of Matthew 16. And so I think that Gavin and I differ on how much typology can tell us, such that Gavin thinks typology can tell us so little that it's not even really the words of Matthew 16. Whereas I'm saying, no, the words of Matthew 16 are typological. So the typology really is telling us something about the passage itself. At 1155, Gavin says, I don't think that Vatican I supremacy and infallibility is there for Peter in Matthew 16 any more than all the disciples in Matthew 18. I think the rest of the New Testament bears that out. Notice that this is um, sounds kind of like model one um, in a way. And I think the patristic testimony is very strong that Peter did not exercise supremacy. He did relate to the other apostles. Oh, excuse me. He did not relate to the other apostles the way the Pope relates to the other bishops. Apologies for that typo. I once again mention my previous responses on supremacy and infallibility. And I'd also like to mention just the work of Michael Lofton and Eric Ibarra here, who I think have shown that no, there was a consistent and quite prevalent tradition in the history of the church, even among the fathers, of a recognition of papal authority. Now, there are nuances to be made and distinctions to be noted, but still, I really don't think that it's fair to characterize things in such a lopsided way. I think that you can find clearly the Vatican I claims in the first millennium claimed by certain fathers, and this is significant. Even Eastern Orthodox scholars who have studied the issue admit, for example, it's here in the formula of Hermisdus, it's here in the tome of Pope, uh, Pope St. Agatho, that you have later what Vatican I would claim as their ecclesiology. Gavin then says, secondly, I definitely don't think succession is there in the text. Any notion of an ongoing office from Peter is completely absent from the New Testament. There's just not even any passage to know where to begin to engage because it's completely absent. I apologize. I seem to have been having technical difficulties. Hopefully nothing was lost from what I said. But anyway, Gavin is basically saying at the 1223 mark that, that we don't really have any evidence for Petrine succession from the New Testament text. I think, uh, once again, um, what this is supposing is that the typology really doesn't get us that. The other thing, too, is to ask whether or not the living memory, the testimony outside of the Bible, can also badly help us on this particular question. Remember, we need to distinguish between solo scriptura and sola scriptura. Gavin, I believe, has this expectation that anything that is binding for doctrine should all be contained in the Bible. And my response is simply, well, let's see if that's in fact true. For example, do we have an authentic saying and teaching of Jesus that is outside of the Bible? Well, I think clearly in the writings of First Clement, we do. So, for example, when Clement mentions that Jesus warned the apostles about the office of bishop, meaning that the office of bishop was not just a later invention and creation of the church, but Jesus, in fact, in his infinite wisdom, saw that this office would need help and need assistance, he basically told the apostles, you need to set up a plan for succession. If that's the case, 
then I think given the good grounds that we have for believing that Clement is a reliable witness and has access to living memory of the apostles, in fact, personally knew them, uh, that we have reasons to believe then that this is an authentic saying of Jesus. And so I think, in other words, there are ways to show that at some point, sola scriptura becomes solo scriptura and becomes absurd. I also want to just thank Gavin for being kind to Jimmy, because near the end of the video, Gavin does mention that he apologizes if he dragged Jimmy into a conversation that he didn't want to be in. I appreciate Gavin doing that. But um, the conclusion of my presentation, um, at least of this part of Gavin's argument, is really Gavin has stressed that he wants to have an ironic charitable tone. I do not believe that what Gavin has currently done with my representation, with representing my argument, or really the lack thereof, um, the, the representation of my responses to his objections, of my argumentation, I don't think Gavin has really made any attempt to steel man me. If you were writing a philosophy paper, a doctoral dissertation, doing a debate, you would always try as insofar as you can to restate your opponent's position as accurately and as well as possible. If I have failed in any way in that in this conversation, then I'm willing to be corrected. But when Gavin literally does not mention my responses, it is very, I'm, I don't wanna, anyway. So regarding the nature of my argument, um, I think it's at this point, this slide is useful here because it's explaining what exactly is my argument claiming. And it's also going into what is the debate and where does it need to go? And so really this is a proposal for future debates and research. The fundamental question is this, what is the best way to interpret the typological nature of the textual illusion between Isaiah 22, 22 and Matthew 16, 19? So notice if you reject a typology, then we need to talk about that. If you reject a textual illusion, we need to talk about that. But nonetheless, the fundamental debate is what is the best way to interpret the typological nature of the textual illusion. I'm proposing that the way that we should structure this debate is the following. It is responsible to discern as much as possible what the typology tells us. Let's give typology its due. And so the fundamental debate then are the principles of typological interpretation. Regardless of what anyone will say, like, oh, no, no, Swan, the, the debate's not about the principles of typological interpretation. It's about what the rest of the New Testament says. Even to say that, oh, we need to look at what the rest of the New Testament says is a typological kind of principle, right? So we need to debate that and discuss these things. And so ultimately the debate's gonna hinge on whose principles or model are or is the best. Can typology also get us the precision we need for doctrine? We shouldn't rule it out a priori. We should just say, all right, can it get us what we need or what you would need, you know, Catholic Swan? The dialectical concern then is, look, we can use other New Testament texts, but we need a system or principles for how they relate to the typology as well. To assume that the New Testament limits Matthew 16, 19 is simply that, an assumption that is open to debate. So in my presentation today, I've discussed the context of the recent conversation, Aquinas' look at typology, contemporary scholarship on the distinction between allegory and typology, the nature of how I'm using the term and also engaging the objection, is it just a shadow? I gave my four defenses once again. I talked about is typology posterior to doctrine? We looked at Gavin's objections. I focused on the nature of the argument and the debate going forward. And here I am presenting my conclusions. My hope in my presentation today is that I've offered a lot of clarification on how we should be going about debating this particular point. And I hope in the future that Gavin and others will actually cite my defenses and respond to me directly.